Hey guys, so today we're going to go over chapter 16.4, and that as the um, title of this says is Evidence of Evolution. So we have seven big pieces of ev or evidence that we can use to uh, back up Darwin's theory. We have, oops, click in here, we have artificial selection, the fossil record, geographic distribution, homologous structures, embryology, DNA, and we actually see it happen. So we're going to go through each one of these, and if you don't have this somewhere in your notes, let's make sure that you add it. So artificial selection. Um, Darwin actually used artificial selection to kind of think about how instead of people artificially selecting for certain traits, nature is going to artificially, or not artificially, nature is going to select for certain traits. So in artificial selection, um, nature is going to provide us with variation through mutation, sexual reproduction, and humans then choose the traits that they find useful. Um, so example, we have these dog breeds here. In uh, Mexico, um, the Chihuahua had some religious significance in um, Ireland the wolfhound was bred to hunt wolves so their stature was important there same with the St. Bernard so the St. Bernard that bigger it's a huge dog that's slobbering gross but it's a huge dog that um, was bred to be that size so it could rescue um, travelers of mountain passes in the Swiss Alps between Italy and Switzerland and then we have that dash hound which was bred in Germany to hunt badgers. And badgers are small little things, and so it's important that the dash hound be a small little dog. So we also have the fossil record. So as you know, fossils are the remains of ancient organisms found in the layers of rock and earth. And Darwin actually, and the people of his time, knew that fossils were um, ancient organisms. So they had that understanding, and that's kind of what led Darwin to kind of think, well, how are these fossils connected with living organisms? So the layers of the rock tell us the history of the earth, while the fossils can tell us the history of life. Um, the fossils are thought to always be the same age as the rock. So the farther deep within the rock layers that you get, the less complex the organism is. So the older that organism is. We also see in the fossil record a transitional fossils. So you see like ones like you wouldn't connect this fish here, this low fin fish with the iguana. However, there's an in-between fossil that we can see maybe how it went from the low fin fish to the early tetrapod to then the um, modern iguana. You see that transition there. Um, basically, it shows us change over time. And so we can see that as you're um, late here in the late Protozoic um, era, we're going to see like less um, complexity. And so we're going to see less complex things become more complex over time. And it kind of helps us with our idea of evolution because eventually traits become adaptations. And those adaptations become or allow an organism to become more fit. So if Darwin's theory is correct, you would expect to find closely related yet different species living in a geographic region as they spread into nearby habitats and evolved. Um, and that's exactly what we do see. So remember the tortoises, they adapted to different habitats as they spread from the mainland to different islands. Um, even finches, the same thing. Darwin studied their beaks. He found that um, their beak sizes were dependent on um, the type of food that was on that island, okay? And so if we had um, a large beak, they were probably opening like larger nuts. If we had smaller beaks, they were maybe um, fruit bearers and stuff like that. So. Um, Basically, lots of vegetation led to short necks of this turtle here. Uh, we had little vegetation for this tortoise. They needed long necks to reach that little vegetation. And then we had that intermediate vegetation. We saw tortoises with intermediate necks. So we have divergent evolution, which equals adaptive radiation, which is something that's a little more complex for you guys. And so don't worry about knowing divergent evolution um, quite yet. Um, but again, here are the big sizes of the Galapagos finches. Um, so remember, Darwin studied tortoises and finches, and specifically he studied the beaks of the finches. Um, and they were, um, he saw that they adapted to eating a variety of different kinds of foods. And so their beaks were different based on the foods that they ate. So again, if Darwin's theory is correct, you would also expect to find different species living far apart 
in far apart geographic regions, uh, but similar habitats becoming more alike as they adapt to the early eco or similar ecosystems. And again, that's what we see. Um, so an example, whale and shark, nothing alike, okay? One is a mammal, one is a fish. Um, whales and sharks, they have a similar body design, even though they have diff they're different organisms. And that's just because they have independently adapted to living in a similar environment. So they look very, very similar that they have similar features, but um, that's just because the environment that they live in. And so we call it convergent evolution. Again, not important term for you to know, but just something interesting to look at. Okay, so we also see this here. Um, whales are closely related to wolves but don't look or act much like them. That's divergent evolution. But whales and sharks, um, distant re distantly related, but look and act alike um, because they live in the same environment. So that's convergent evolution. Um, so in conclusion, the pressures of the environment basically drive evolution. So wherever you live, that's basically gonna drive what adaptations are most fit. Another one is our homologous structures. So homologous structures, you can kind of see an example here. So we have all these different bones of different organisms, but they're all kind of the same. So are they similar and they're found in, the sim in similar spots. So homologous body structures are ones that, um, like limbs and vertebrates, they look different, but are made from the same bones because they are made from the same clump of undifferentiated cells in the embryo. Okay, so the way you can think about it, look different but the same bones okay so here's just another example you can kind of see all these purple all the purple bones here okay we have our organisms have them even this whale here um, they have the bones but they look different okay so this is the ancient lobe fin fish we have the turtle alligator bird and mammal and so that's the homologous structure um, homologous structures are vestigial um, or some are vestigial, meaning that they basically aren't used anymore, but they haven't gone away. So the hip bone in a whale, why hasn't that hip bone gone away? Well, that's because the whale, it's not chosen for or against. Um, a whale doesn't go up to another whale and go, do you have a hip bone? No, that doesn't happen. Um, so it doesn't help the whale, it doesn't hurt the whale. So that hip bone is going to remain in place. The same is going to go for the human appendix, which we call the cecum in the rat. So why don't we have, um, or why do we still have an appendix if we don't use it? Like you don't go up to someone that you're about to uh, maybe ask on a date and, so, and say, hey, do you have an appendix? Ooh, you do? Ugh, that, mm, no. You don't do that, that just sounds silly. Um, so it's not, good or bad, it's not chosen for or against, and so that's why we still have our appendixes. Now people whose appendix bursts and they pass, obviously they can't pass on their genes. Um, but so gradually over time, our appendix has gotten smaller, whereas the appendix in a rat is still relatively large, and it's based on what they eat. So um, why grow a tail and then lose it? This is another example of embryology. So um, human embryo has a tail at four weeks and you can kind of see it here. The tail then disappears at about eight weeks. Um, skinks are a type of lizard in some species. Um, they have our legs have become so small that they no longer function in walking. So why would an organism possess organs with no or little function? Well, one explanation for this is that the genetic code is present to make the organ, but the function has not been lost through change over time. So again, if the organ is not vital to survival, or nature is neither choosing for or against it, it's not gonna cause it to be eliminated. So the legs on the skink, they're still gonna show up even though they don't use it and they just slither. Um, we also see analogous structures. Um, and analogous structures are basically um, structures in different species. Um, they have the same function, but they're made from different tissue. So the um, wing of a butterfly is, not, is definitely not made out of the same material as wing of a bat or wing of a bird. So again, um, they don't have the same origin but they have the same function. 
So embryology, we talked about that. Embryos of many animals with uh, backbones look very similar um, in earlier early development. Well, that kind of can lead us to the idea that if they look similar in early development, maybe they're coming from the same cells. So like it says here that um, it's clear the same groups of undifferentiated cells develop in the same order to produce the same tissues and organs of all vertebrates, suggesting that they all evolved from a common ancestor. And then we have similarities in DNA. So in DNA, um, similarities in DNA and protein suggest um, or sequence that suggests relatedness. So percent of amino acids that are identical to the amino acids in human hemoglobin. Um, so we have a human is 100%. Obviously, they're going to have the same. But a monkey, a rehis monkey, is 95% or has 95% of the same amino acids in, a, in the human hemoglobin as the human. Okay, so it's very closely related. And as you see, we go down this... Um, the less amino acids in common, the less um, recently they descended from a common ancestor. We also see similar karyotypes that suggest an evolutionary relationship. So for instance, the human 46 chromosome, chimpanzee 48 chromosomes. Um, when we look at their karyotype, we see banding pattern matches. So if you take the two smaller chromosomes apes have that we don't and place them end to end, the banding pattern is identical to the number two chromosome a human has, which um, they don't have. So they don't have this chromosome, but when we arrange it this way, they look identical. We also see um, that telomeres, so telomeres are found at the end of the chromosomes to protect them um, during um, replication. Basically, we see telomeres um, sequences are found at the ends and also in the middles of the human chromosome number two, which suggests that it was once made by the fusing of two chromosomes together. Okay, so think about what the um, chimp has and what the human then doesn't. We also have an extra centromere. So chromosome number two has an inactive centromere that's not used. So also last, or not last but not least, but do you ever wonder why dogs and cats don't need to eat vi or fresh fruit, but we do? It's kind of strange that they can just eat canned or bagged um, food. Uh, while fish, amphibians, reptiles, and most mammals can make their own vitamin C, but humans need to eat fresh fruit or they will end up with scurvy, so pirate's disease, so the loss of teeth, pale skin, sunken eyes. Um, and our DNA actually contains the enzyme that codes for it, but it's not functional. So we have the enzyme, or we have the DNA for it, but our body doesn't create it, which is kind of crazy. Um, guess what other group of organisms lack this ability? Well, hopefully you could say primates, which includes the chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas, and other apes. Um, humans have many other non-functional vestigial genes, um, so they're called pseudogenes. So uh, we also have more than 99 different odoreceptor genes, but more than 70 of them are turned off or non-functional. So we, can, we have the genes to um, smell more than we actually do, but they just don't work. And the last but not least, we can actually see this occur. So the pepper moth is an example. The Grant's experiments, which you read about in your book, where they looked at the um, changing in beak size of finches on the Galapagos, is also an example. So um, there's a natural variation in populations of pepper moths. We have a typical form, or a typica form, which is the lighter color. And we have the, and you can kind of see that there. Okay. Uh, we also have a, oh, sorry. A darker form and that's this one here so basically the story of this the Industrial Revolution came around in England and before the Industrial Revolution um, you predominantly saw these light colored moths the white moths then the Industrial Revolution kicked in and a lot of smog was put into the air well what the light moths used to live on was something called uh, lichen and lichen was white that lived on trees they had some kind of camouflage. Well, when the smog came into the air, it really polluted that air and it killed the lichen. So now the um, lighter moths had no more camouflage. And so what happened is um, we saw a change from most of the moths um, 
being light colored to then them being 98% of them being the dark variety. And so in recent years, the lichen has been able to kind of grow back and we're starting to see again, a color change in the moth populations in England. Um, we can also see it like every day when we think about diseases. So changing diseases um, cause microbes that produce no, new organisms and new diseases. So bird flu, HIV, antibiotic resistant tuberculosis. So we're constantly having to get people that have HIV and new um, drugs because they're constantly changing. Um, the flu, there's a new flu shot every year. That's constantly changing. Why is it changing? Because the flu's not being able to spread if people ha are resistant to it. So whatever isn't resistant, that form stays alive and then spreads and then we have to figure out a new way to attack it. And so guys, those are the seven different ways that, um, are, that help us have evidence or that is evidence for evolution. Um, that's all for 16.4.